FLM, wide open thinking, world-class work, and far-reaching results. Now with locations in Minneapolis, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Washington, D.C. A strategic marketing and communications company dedicated to serving clients who specialize in the business of agriculture and the life of rural communities. Good evening, and welcome to the 163rd Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. The Landon Lectures began in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late K-State President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. It is especially fitting as we celebrate our 150th anniversary as a land-grant university that we welcome former Secretaries of Agriculture Ed Schaefer, Mike Johans, Ann Veneman, Dan Glickman, Mike Espy, and John Block to the Landon Podium to join 162 predecessors in bringing their thoughts and opinions on important public issues. At this time, I'd like to introduce some distinguished guests in the audience. Tonight, we're pleased to have with us United States Senator Jerry Moran. Jerry, if you can... Uh Kansas Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Dale Rodman. Dale. I've seen several members of the Kansas legislature who are here joining us this evening. Will the members of the legislature please stand and be recognized? I know. Joining us from Senator Pat Roberts' office is Mr. Melvin Thompson. Melvin, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. I get to stand up and make the introductions and speeches. There are a lot of folks that really spend a lot of time putting all this together. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jackie Hartman, Chairperson of the Landon Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. Jackie, you stand and please be recognized. So, thank you. Some of our other uh, faculty and staff leaders with us tonight, Dr. Betsy Cobble, co-chair of the Faculty Affairs Committee and department head for the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work. Okay. Jan Taggart, president of the Classified Senate. Jan, thank you. Eli Schooley, K-State student body president, Eli. And then my wife, First Lady of K-State, Dr. Noel Schultz. Noel, thank you. <laughs> Normally I forget to introduce her, so it'll be a much more pleasant evening tonight for me at least. So um, it's now my pleasure to provide a brief introduction for each of the secretaries. And I'd ask that you hold your applause, please, after I go through each one. To begin with, Secretary Ed Schaefer served two terms as the governor of North Dakota and served as the nation's 29th Secretary of Agriculture during the final year of the Bush administration from 2008 to 2009. S Senator Mike Johans, who represents Nebraska in the Senate, served as secretary from 2005 to 2008. Days after he took office, he began working with U.S. trading partners to reopen their markets to U.S. beef. Nearly 119 countries had closed their markets after a single finding of a cow infected with BSE, commonly called mad cow disease. Within his first year, Senator Johans convinced nearly half that number to reopen their markets. Ann Veneman served as secretary from 2001 to 2005. She was actively involved in the Uruguay round of general agreements of tariffs and trade negotiations, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement. Dan Glickman was the second Kansan to serve in the role of Secretary of Agriculture. He served as secretary from 1995 to 2001. For 18 years, he served in the U.S. House of Representatives as Kansas' fourth congressional district. He contributed to the Farm Bills of 1977, 1981, 1985, and 1990. Mike Espy served as secretary from 1993 to 1994. He was first elected to Congress in 1986 and served on the Agriculture and Budget Committees. Within these committees, he served on several task forces, including the Natural Resources Community and Economic Development, 
the Lower Mississippi Delta Caucus, and the Select Committee on Hunger's Domestic Task Force. John Block served as Secretary from 1981 to 1986. Previously, he was Secretary of Agriculture in Illinois. After leaving the USDA, Secretary Block became the President of the National American Wholesaler Grocers Association based in Washington, D.C. Secretary Clayton Uter was unable to join us this evening. He was recovering from travel, surgery and cannot travel. Folks, please join me in welcoming these secretaries to K-State. At this time, I'd like to call Der Dr. Barry Flinchball, professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics, to the podium to serve as moderator for this evening's lecture. Folks, it's, uh, Barry talked about wanting to do this some time ago and, and uh, had seen a similar uh, sort of uh, event in Nebraska. And when he told us, hey, we're going to get all these folks to Manhattan, Kansas, uh, there was a little skepticism in the office at the time. So I want to give a lot of uh, shout out here to Barry for the work he did uh, in talking with each of these individuals and really making what I think will be a special land and lecture event. So please uh, join me in thanking Barry Flinchball for all he's done. Barry, it's all yours. Thank you, uh, President Schultz. Uh, at age 71, I'm going to stay sitting and not go to the podium <laughs> for two hours. Um, this afternoon, the secretaries visited with uh, my students in ag policy. Uh, this is my 42nd ag policy class that I've taught here. It was a marvelous experience to listen to the give and take and the really bright questions those students ask. I'm very proud of them. And I told them last Friday this was a great experience that they were about to partake in. What a treat. Um, I've known each of these gentlemen, many of them for years, and then specially, I have known Madam Secretary from California. Uh, she won't let me tell you how many years we go back. <laughs> 20. Um, so it's just wonderful for me to have all these great people here. When they're finished tonight, your faith in government will will be renewed. I hope so. And God knows we need it. Oh, oh no. <laughs> this is Secretary Glickman's home state. And so I've asked him to go first. <clears throat> Five to seven minutes, not 10 or 20. We go way back to when he was president of the Wichita School Board, city boy. <laughs> First time we met, I explained to him the difference between a bull and a steer. Oh. <laughs> and is he a quick study? I mean, he learned that just immediately. Dan, it's all yours. Well, you know, um, it was hard to resist Barry. When you look up in the dictionary under the word tenacious, his picture is there. <laughs> and uh, I think we did this because we didn't want him emailing us and calling us. But it is a great pleasure to be here. And as, as a Kansan, I'm delighted to be here. And um, I, I would just tell you, I'm with all my colleagues here. Being Secretary of Agriculture was the greatest job I ever had. And I'm I don't know if the others feel the same way, but uh, nowhere else on earth can you impact the lives of so many people, farmers, consumers, business people, not only here but around the world. And to be here on your, about your 150th anniversary of K-State, by the way, you like the tie? Jackie Hartman got me this tie. Okay. All right. Um, but uh, to be here when the Department of Agriculture was actually uh, came together as a, by Abraham Lincoln in 1862. It was created as a Commission on Agriculture, 
and uh, it then became an actual cabinet level department in 1889, I think it was. And uh, so it's the timing is fortuitous. Great land grant school, great public university, and uh, celebrating the Department of Agriculture as being a partner with K State and being a partner to farmers and ranchers and consumers. It's just a tremendous experience to be here. So I'm delighted. And I just thought I would try to maybe open this with mentioning just a, a few things today. And that is, we've got a lot of challenges in this country as it affects food and agriculture. The big challenge is demographics. We're going to have about nine, nine and a half billion people in 30 to 40 years. We're going to have to double food production, double food production, and also increase production because incomes and economic conditions are growing in places like China and India and Indonesia and in Africa as well. And so we've got to do all of this. At the same time, we've got to do it without ripping up the soils and the forests of the world. We've got to do it sustainably. We've got to do it with no more utilization of water and better utilization of water. We've got to do it with climate and weather variability. We've got to do it with the vagaries of the budget crisis that we're in and with a government that doesn't perform its functions in agriculture with the same degree of civility and trust that we've seen it in the past, particularly in the area of agriculture. So those are really big challenges. And it's going to be incumbent on land-grant schools to, to help be a great part of finding answers to those challenges and helping the Department of Agriculture and the Congress and the private sector to try to deal with those. So the challenges are really real. They're real for all of us. But there are some opportunities as well, great things that are happening. Number one, food and agriculture are actually hot topics now. They're high up on the agenda. They're no longer viewed as kind of second class issues. They're in the international agenda. People are concerned about them as they relate to the global food security issues. They're concerned about them as they relate to stability of the world. They're concerning about them, about pricing and inflation, and people care about them. And that is good news for agriculture. The second thing is, by and large, the farm economy overall, realizing that natural disasters hit us, but the farm economy has never been better. And after years and years and years of low prices and bad economic conditions, my judgment is we're in a different era. We're in an era of a much, much stronger farm economy overall. And I'm not Pollyannish about it. There will be ups and downs. But the, but the era of agriculture being the weak sister in American economics is over. And that's great news for students and kids who want to be involved in agriculture. And it's great news for uh, consumers as well, who, by the way, want to know more about what's in their food. And they're going to be more and more engaged about what's going on as well. And as we deal with issues like diet and obesity and other things that really probably were not at the top of the consideration of people in, the, in this world before. And so the Department of Agriculture is still a big player in all of this, but so is the land-grant college community. And uh, let's hope that with the challenges that I talked about, particularly the budget challenges that make it so difficult to have the resources to do what we need to do, that we can turn this farm economy into a jewel of America where it's a, a business that young people will want to go in and want to stay in, and will, America will continue to be a, a leader in the world. So, Barry, with that, I thought I, maybe I'd set the stage for perhaps a uh, discussion that will occur afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to go in order of service. And my longtime friend Jack Block goes back to Ronald Reagan. So, Jack? Thank you. I think the way I want to open this, uh, first of all, uh, Barry, thank you. Good to be with you and uh, my fellow former secretaries of agriculture. Uh, we're kind of a, a clan working together. We've been on a few programs and it's great fun and we exchange ideas and actually we agree quite a bit, a whole lot more than the Congress does right now in Washington. <laughs> yeah. I, I am optimistic about the future of agriculture and I'm going to talk just briefly about it. I am optimistic because I have seen the dramatic change in this industry just in the last 50 years. It's just been astounding. My father, when he first got 
busy on the farm. He was picking a hundred bushel ear corn in a day by hand. We pick and shell a hundred bushel of shell corn in seven minutes. We used to have two old horses, Bert and Bill, that pulled a two-row corn planter. Now we have a 32-row corn planter at our farm in Illinois. We used to milk our cows by hand, eight or ten cows, morning and night, by hand. We took the milk into the basement and we bottled it. And we sold it in my grandfather's store in Knoxville, Illinois. Was it pasteurized? No. That's real organic milk. <laughs> <laughs> and our crop yields have just exploded over a period of time. I've got a chart on the office at the farm, and I always look at it when I go back there. And it starts uh, recording our yields starting back in 1964. Every year, every year, 50 years, all the way up. And the chart goes like this. That's the way it goes. And that's what's happening to agriculture and the progress that we're making. We raise pigs. We used to maybe be lucky to get six pigs per litter weaned. Now it's close to 10. And the weeds and the corn and beans, we were hoeing them with a hoe. And high school kids would come out and help. I hated that. I hated it almost as bad as milking those cows by hand. <laughs> and today, there are no weeds in the corn or beans. We don't have the corn borer ripping off the ears and the root worms eating the roots. We have precision farming, GPS guiding us through the fields, all kinds of new technology. Genetic engineering is the hottest thing going right now, and yet it's being attacked by some people that just don't understand the value, I guess. Consumers in this country have a bargain. Their food, they're spending less than 10% of their family income on food. There's no other country in the world can come even close. It's, it's just dramatic what we have done. Doubling production is what we're going to have to do, as, as you pointed out, Dan, by 2050. I have no doubt but what we can do this and we can satisfy the demand. Look what we did over the last 50 years. And we've, we're still hard at it. We are creative in this country, and we're inventing things yet. We just have to continue to move ahead and use the new technology. You cannot let the critics stop us from using new technology, whether it's GE or something else. You just have to use it, or we're not going to meet our objective. I think these are very exciting times, and I look forward to discussing this issue with this uh, group tonight. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Jack. Uh, next, we'll turn to uh, Mike Espy, who served with Bill Clinton. Mike? Well, thank you, Barry, and I want to thank all of my colleagues in the cabinet for, for uh, being here. I uh, want to uh, show my appreciation to Kansas State University, its administration, its faculty, staff, and its students, and I want to, to uh, congratulate you on your 150th anniversary. I think that's awesome. Now, we've heard about Burton Bill. We've, uh, we've, we've, we've talked about optimism as far as agriculture is concerned. And uh, I'm also optimistic, but I want to inject maybe just a note of political realism into the discussion tonight. I mean, I'm a creature of the House of Representatives, like Dan Glickman. I've served for, there for seven years, uh, proud to serve there from the state of Mississippi. But the House of Representatives, where I was so proud to serve for about seven years, uh, it's not the same place as it was when I was privileged to, to serve there. And I think that it will have an impact on the Farm Bill and all discussions relating to bills which have historically been bipartisan. I mean, if there's one bill among the myriad of hundreds of thousands of bills passed by the, the, the Congress, the House, and the Senate, the Ag Bill was the one where partisan interests would be set aside and everyone would, would come together because they, they recognized that at least, you know, everyone would eat. And the Farm Bill had a tremendous impact 
on the, on the balance of trade for the last 50 years, tremendous impact on the gross domestic product, and it was the industry that really makes the United States what it is today. Uh, but it does not look like the same place. You know, uh, when I was a, a House member, uh, I started there in, in 1986, and I decided that I wanted to become a martial artist. I wanted to take Taekwondo. And I started out as a white belt. And I worked my way for four years up to a second degree black belt. And I'm saying that for this reason. Every morning, I'd get up and go to the house gym where, you know, uh, the, the Taekwondo instructor would meet us. And in that class, there'd be about 25 house members, Democrat and Republican. For that length of time, every morning, we do our katas, we do our demonstrations, we fight each other and we'd shower, and then we'd go to work. And then when we went upstairs in committee rooms, when we had contentious discussions about this or that, uh, and someone would make a particularly mean point to me, I'd turn around and I'd say, you know, I've seen you naked. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, you get more respect, you get, you get, the discussion turns a bit more civil, and you get things done. There's a, it would turn into a more harmonious conversation. And I, I've just got to tell you, I think we're going to have a farm bill. I, I, I think we will. I mean, we have to. I think everyone there understands that uh, we have to have, you know, the right market signals or predictability and security. I think, I think you know, wisdom is going to prevail, and we're, we're going to do it. But it's not going to be easy. And I don't want to, to, to pretend to anyone in this audience that, that it's easy because the attitude has changed in the House and Senate. Now, what do I mean? Just, just a second. If I was in Bear Flinch Ball's class, uh, agriculture e economics, and I would put uh, a graph of political attitudes in the Congress relating to bills which used to be harmonious and bipartisan, I'd first look for the midpoint. I'd first look to that midpoint of that graph, and these would be the political moderates. But if you look around to try to find political moderates in the House and the Senate, uh, there are fewer of them today than there used to be. Why? Because uh, gerrymandering, they lost in the primary. If they're still there, they're fearful that they will lose in the primary. They'll draw an opponent from their right flank or their left flank. And so they're much more careful than they used to be. But this is the group which, which, paid, uh, uh, which championed the Farm Bill. They, 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 they recognize the benefits of the Farm Bill for 70 years. And they're just, they're just uh, more timid, I, I guess. And so what that does is it, it puts the political energy out to the flanks, the, 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 the left of center and the, and the right of center. And that's where the energy is, particularly now in this Farm Bill discussion, that the nutrition title has been stripped out, delinked, and considered separately. We, we, we do know that was a farm bill vote in the House of Representatives in July, and it failed. And that, that's really never happened before. So what's happening? In my opinion, on this political graph, you go from the midpoint where the moderates used to be uh, so vested, and now the energy is now gone out to the flanks. On the left flank, I'd say the Democratic flank, now they are, they are, they are uh, characterized, I'd say, by urban Democrats who used to only be able just to have an interest in the farm bill because there was a nutrition title and rural development and research, but mostly it was uh, the SNAP program and, and the food stamps. And that's been delinked from the program, causing angst and a loss of leverage that used to be there and less of a vested interest. And so now they see the farm bill really just more in social class terms. Okay, we got a farm bill. And, we, and, and agri agriculture now is so concentrated that we've got 9% of farm producers getting about 53% of the program payments. And they see that as being unfair. But there's nothing to link them to the, to the, to the, to the substantive bill anymore. And that is a problem. And then you go out on the right flank, where now the energy there, we've seen what's happened recently with shutdown of the government and, and uh, you know, almost uh, a debt default of the United States. And now we see uh, another group, don't want to call any names, but honestly, it just seems like they want to burn down the place. But in that fire will be agriculture. People who just don't really believe in the merits of government ideologically uh, need to know that 
this is a government program. It's beneficial, and I think it's really sacrosanct. So we got a real problem, guys. And uh, I, I, uh, I know my time is up, but I, I just think that this is one bill where Democrats and Republicans have historically worked together uh, to benefit this nation, and I'd like it to go back to the way it was. Thank you, Mike. Um, there are three people on this stage that served with George W. Bush, beginning with Madam Secretary from California. Anne? Well, thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure and, an, and, and really an honor to be here with all my uh, fellow former secretaries. And, and Barry, let me just say thank you very much. And we've known each other over 20 years, <laughs> just for the record. And it, it's great to be, be here at K-State and, uh, and to, to really celebrate this 150th anniversary of the, of the university, and it's a great university. Um, I spent five years after I was Secretary of Agriculture as the Executive Director of the United Nations Children's Fund, which is a UN organization. And so I had the opportunity to look at some of these issues a bit more from a, a global perspective. And I want to just talk for a moment about food security, as, as Dan uh, Glickman raised, um, and, and really some of the challenges and the opportunities in that regard. And, and that is, as he said, the population of the world, as we know, is going to increase to 9 billion people by the year 2050, which is about a $2 billion, $2 billion person increase. With the requirements of f food being estimated by some at, at, at the need for, for about 60 to 70 percent more food. Now, we have today, the, F the Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that we have about 842 million people around the world who are, suffer from chronic food insecurity. And when we look at this, of particular concern are young children. Um, one of the issues that's gotten increasing focus in the last few years is, is something that people are talking about called the first thousand days, and that's the time in the life from conception to age two. And inadequate nutrition during this time period can impair brain development permanently, which then uh, impairs the ability to learn in school and earn as, as an adult. And so it, it simply continues the cycle of poverty. But there's something else that's being talked about more and more, and that is what's called the double burden of malnutrition. In addition to the 842 million people that are chronically hungry, the, food, the, the World Health Organization estimates that there are one, over 1.4 billion people in the world who are overweight, and of those, 500 million, 200 million more population than we have in the U.S., 500 million people in the world are obese, which this causes all kinds of additional issues. Um, chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and this increases the cost of health care and it decreases the productivity of individuals. This double burden is not just a global issue, but it's one that we have to face here at home as well. Uh, as you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture administers the food, the food and nutrition programs, including what is commonly referred to the, as the food stamp program, is now called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. That program has, has gone in from about 28 million people on it in 2008 to 47 million people today. Um, there's, a, there's a documentary film that came out uh, earlier this year called A Place at the Table that really talks about, it's a chilling account of hunger in America. Today, 53% of the children born in this country are born into families that are eligible for the Women, Infants, and Children program. And on the double burden side, obesity in this, in this country has skyrocketed with one-third of the population now suffering from obesity and again raising the cost of health care in this country by trillions of dollars. For too long, we've addressed these issues of hunger um, 
as of hunger and malnutrition is about how do we get calories to people? And now we know that we have to change that debate and start talking about how do we get nutrition to people. Um, the issues of, of food, hunger, and health have to be looked at um, together, and we have to look at the issues of nutrition. We also have, in addressing these issues, about 40% of the world's food is wasted, goes to waste. In the developing world, it's often because of inadequate storage, insect infestation, lack of transportation. In this country and other developed countries, it's primarily food that's thrown out from restaurants, grocery stores, and your own refrigerators. Um, we have an increasing focus on the sustainability of agriculture, the importance of conservation, of environmental protection, of, of water, as Dan Glickman points out. Over 70% of the world's water is used for agriculture. Um, there are um, increasing consumer demand for certifications for organic, for sustainably produced, for fair trade. Farmers markets in this country have dramatically increased as people want to be more connected with their food. They've increased from 1,775 in 1994 to over 8,000 in 2013. Um, it's also very important that we continue to expand <coughs> agriculture trade, which has been so important to the overall health of U.S. agriculture for so many years. But we also have to help build agriculture in the developing world. Um, there's, a, there's a program called Feed the Future now that's being done government-wide. And it, and it really is about investing in agriculture around the world, not just providing food aid. Protecting the agriculture systems, whether it's our food safety systems, protecting our agriculture from pests and disease, critical. And of course, something that's near and dear to the heart of any land-grant university, research, science, and technology, just absolutely essential to the future of the food and agriculture system and in solving the problems and creating new opportunities. Thank you. Uh, next is Senator Mike uh, Johans from Nebraska. Uh, we'll get you a purple tie, too, before you leave. <laughs> you know, he I, served uh, George W. Bush also. Mike? Yeah, thank you very much. I was uh, curious about our record with the Wildcats uh, wow. while I was governor. Uh, you'll be interested to know that in the six years I was governor, we lost four out of those six games. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, th I then left the state to go to Washington. We won the next six games and left for the Big Ten. So <laughs> that's, that's my history. I, I want to give a shout out to uh, two colleagues of mine in the United States Senate uh, who I work with every day, uh, who are two of the most honorable people you'd ever meet. Uh, and that's uh, your two United States Senators, Pat Roberts and Jerry Moran. They are exactly the kind of people that I would expect the great state of Kansas to elect to the Senate. They're tough, thoughtful conservatives, and they do a great job for you. And I'm not running for re-election, so I, don't, I have no, no dog in this fight, but I just uh, I so enjoy serving with both of them. I often tell people, I, I grew up on a dairy farm in northern Iowa, a small family farm in the 1950s and 60s. My father had uh, three sons, and uh, his notion of building character in his three sons was to hand us a pitchfork or a scoop shovel, send us to the dairy barn or the hog house, and we would stand, you know, ankle deep and you know what, and scoop away, pitch away. Little did my dad know that what he was really doing is preparing his youngest son, Mike, for his life in politics. So. <laughs>
<laughs> That's a good line. It is great to be here. It's great to be on this stage. Uh, these are some people that uh, I've worked with through the years, uh, respect a great deal, and so it's always, it's always a lot of fun when we're together. Um, one of the things that I did, as you know, when I was Secretary of Agriculture, uh, the Bush administration wanted to uh, submit a complete farm bill uh, while I was there, so uh, we went across the United States listening to farmers, and uh, we did one of those events here in Kansas. Jerry was there with me and, and Pat Roberts, and uh, it was billed just like we said it would be. There was no set format. It's not like we invited the president of the Farm Bureau to be there and although they were welcome to be there, but literally for three, three and a half, four hours, I just sat there on a stool at the front of the stage and I took notes as farmers just came up to the microphone or people who were involved in some way with the Farm Bill and they would tell me what they liked, they would tell me what they disliked, uh, they would chew me out over something, they would applaud us for things. I did over 20 of those myself. We went to all 50 states um, in this effort to build information for the Farm Bill. Somewhere along the line, I don't even remember what state it was, I had a farmer come to the microphone and uh, that day we had spent a lot of time talking about Farm Bill, Farm Policy, and he offered an interesting observation that has stuck with me through all these years. He said, uh, Mike, we have to get beyond this notion where our total focus is on a farm bill. He said, good farm policy is not just about a farm bill. And I've thought about what he said so much uh, over these years, and, and he even went on to talk about this. Yes, we need a farm bill, I want to get you a five-year farm bill as much as anything. I was asked recently, what things do you want checked off your list before you leave the Senate? I want a five-year farm bill. That's at the top of the list. I know how important it is to agriculture to get that done. But it's not the only thing that's going to make agriculture successful. We need good trade policy. You know, if you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, 95% of the world's population doesn't live here. They live in another part of the world. I just got back from a trip to Africa, uh, and in various parts of Africa, we are seeing great success. The AIDS drugs are working, some governments are stabilizing, admittedly in other parts not so good. But the one thing we see is that as incomes improve and people have more disposable income, they want to improve the diet for their family. And oftentimes, that means protein. That means Nebraska beef, Kansas beef. It means the products that we raise here so well. Good farm policy means good research at your land-grant universities. And then not only having good research, having an outstanding extension service that can take that development and bring it to the farm, which I believe is one of the reasons why we are just better than anybody in the world when it comes to agriculture. We need good tax policy. You know that bill that was maligned at the end of the year, all the talking heads on radio, et cetera, talked about how awful that was. You could go to our media sites, our social media sites, and see people just hammering us over that. Do you know what that bill did in terms of the estate tax? All of a sudden, you could work a lifetime and put something together and pass it to your children without the government interfering with that because we got the exemption raised permanently. Now, I appreciate what's going on in the world, and you know, there's all kinds of people that are gonna malign what, what we do back in Washington, but that was a gigantic step in the right direction. 
when it came to tax policy, about 99% of Americans, 99% of Americans did not see a tax increase that was going to happen because of the action we took. Now, were there other things that we should have gotten done? Yes. But I've done this long enough to know that sometimes you take the important steps when you can. And believe me, those were important steps. We need good regulatory policy. You know, I'll have farm bill sessions around the state of Nebraska. I bet if Jerry and I went across the state here, one of the first things we would hear is the regulatory overreach. You can't imagine how much time we spend in our Senate offices dealing with average citizens on regulatory overreach. Maybe it's the Department of Labor telling you where your kids can work. Heck, I grew up working for 25 cents an hour driving a hay baler, and I was never so proud in my life. I was barely old enough to reach the clutch on the tractor that drove that hay baler. And you know what? I thought I had arrived. That's what we need. And then the final thing, and I'll wrap up here, we need good young people. You know, I was with the, uh, the other ag secretaries uh, this afternoon. God bless you, you raise great kids here, just like I see back home in Nebraska. And you know what, people like me are going to be moving on. We've done our service. 15 months from now, I go off and do something else. I want to see young people behind me, generation after generation, who care deeply about this country, that we send to Washington who care deeply about making this government work. And you know what? Some days that's a heck of an assignment, but we desperately need it. We desperately need it, and we need them on our farms, and on our ranches, in our universities. We need them across this great country because those kids are truly going to make the difference. So maybe our greatest asset is those young folks we talked to this afternoon who are really going to change the world, in my opinion. Thanks for having me here at K-State. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate your comments, with the exception of one. <laughs> You're followed by a gentleman from North Dakota, and you had to bring up football? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that means, Ed, you don't need to talk about it. Uh, the, the next gentleman was former President Bush's third secretary, and uh, served as governor of North Dakota. Ed? Well, thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here with you tonight. It's a great pleasure to gather with my colleagues here and talk about agriculture and agriculture policy and the global effects that we have. I sure appreciate the opportunity here, um, Dr. Flinchbob, and the, and the uh, chance to interact with all of, that, all of you that are here tonight. President Schultz, thank you for the hospitality to be here on campus. Uh, again, I've been here a couple of times before and I do appreciate getting back. Um, since I've been banned from talking about football <laughs> and, and um, all the other secretaries uh, have mentioned about everything that we need to talk about, politics and policy and global need. We've talked about um, uh, the uh, food security and nutrition about education and things. I, I, I do have to, however, talk about North Dakota a little bit. I'll skip the football effort, but you know, really, um, it's fun to be from North Dakota these days, I have to say. Um, we do have the best economy in the U.S. Uh, it's exciting to see the lowest unemployment rate uh, in the nation and how those jobs and careers and efforts are making a difference in our state and, in fact, this country. Uh, we produce now 12% of the oil in the United States of America. Uh, it's a good quality product and it's uh, being sold well. Um, our personal income in North Dakota has increased 100% in the last 10 years. The GDP has increased 150% in the last 10 years. And I mention this, I'm reminded of the great economy we have and the things I'm reminded 
Uh, recently, my wife and I were hiking in the Grand Canyon, and we ran into a couple from North Dakota. And after the day was over, we got back in the parking lot. I was chatting with these folks, and the, uh, the, the um, female part of the couple uh, was talking about my time in office. She said, I really appreciated when you were governor, because after you left, things really started to get better. <laughs> but, but my point is, when I was governor, I realized North Dakota wasn't just an energy state, it was an agriculture state. And agriculture continues to be the number one piece of the economy uh, that you don't hear about today. As you hear about the energy sector, we've kind of passed over North Dakota agriculture. But really, it is that energy and agriculture that points to the strength of our natural resources in this country. And I like to use North Dakota as an example because it has been such a good one. Five good years of agriculture really has set the economy of North Dakota on fire. And it was a lot of public policy, all things that we've been used to dealing with and used to generating that made the difference. It was public policy that said, we need to create value in North Dakota. So let's do value-added agriculture instead of growing the commodities that we are so well capable of. Um, it is important to note that put policy in place, both federal and state, to enhance exports so that we could export our opportunities in agriculture across the globe. And today, um, North Dakota exports 50% of the agriculture product uh, in North Dakota. Um, and as was mentioned, the United States of America really is in the export agriculture business, the only sector in our economy that has a positive trade balance. But you know it's that exporting of product that really is going to make the difference in the world, I believe. You know, if we look at the opportunity that we have, it's going to, it was mentioned that um, we have to double food production by 2050. Uh, we're looking at a growing population without any more land, any more water. We're going to have to figure out how to do this, how to increase our production and deliver nutrition to the world. And that is going to fall on the backs of Americans farmers. It's going to fall on the backs of agriculture. And as we learn to export our food and our food products, we also export our aid to the world. I was surprised when I was the U.S. representative to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, at the United Nations in Rome. And I'd go there and we'd visit about aid and the world food crisis that took place in, in 2007 and 2008. And People talked about how America had to do better, how we could improve to send food aid to hungry people. And I was shocked to learn that the United States of America, year after year after year, delivers 50%, over half of the food aid in the world all the time, every time. And we're not appreciated for it. We're supposed to do more, and we can do more. And as we look at those opportunities, I think, on the global marketplace, um, we get to see not only do we export our crops, not only do we export our equipment, our technology, our knowledge, not only do we export the economic opportunities that we have for the United States of America, but you know we export our values. And uh, uh, Mike Johans was saying earlier um, the the, the the students that are coming up in agriculture today and how impressive they are, and the values that agriculture delivers. You know, it, when you touch the land, you know about responsibility and honesty and character and values. And those are the things that we are exporting across the globe. I believe that is one of the most important efforts that we can make. Hungry people make unstable governments. Um, Hungry people don't learn. Hungry people don't work. Um, we need to be able to take the strength of the natural resources in the United States of America and transfer that to the global marketplace. So let's tell you a quick three stories here, and then we can get on to the questions. Here's what I think we export. I 
had the opportunity to help negotiate the Colombian Free Trade Agreement. We were down visiting with farmers who had been kicked off their land uh, by the drug lords in Colombia. They were just thrown out in the jungle to fend for themselves. And President Uribe was able to come in to restructure the military to provide safety and security in the rural areas and agriculture started to flourish. I talked to a farmer who had 18 kids, um, you know, um, three wives, they were, weren't all from one poor soul. Um, but, uh, <laughs> they had, they, um, but, but, you know, he talked about how agriculture got him on the land, how agriculture allowed him to make a living, how agriculture allowed him to buy into a uh, processing facility for the crops that he grew, and how agriculture provided three of his kids the opportunity to get educated in the United States of America in agriculture. And he said, that's what it's all about. Agriculture did this for me. It's the education that we can provide across the world that's going to make a difference. I was in a fourth grade class in California, in Northern California, in the midst of fruit country, and uh, one of the little fourth graders asked me, is it true that if you find two strawberries that are grown together and you give it to a girl, it means she'll fall in love with you? <laughs> I said, of course, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, that the agriculture does bring people together. As we grow in our communities, the rural America, as we work the land and grow the crops and provide for the food and the fiber and the feed and now the fuel in this country and around the world. It really is that love of the land and love of the people that we bring together with agriculture as well. And I have no doubt in my mind that as we focus on agriculture and we bring education and we bring nutrition and food and we, when we move out of unstable governments and we have the proper opportunities to present the peace that we can bring among families and communities and neighborhoods by sharing meals at a table, that we really have an opportunity, all of us in the agriculture arena, to, to affect the education and the love and the peace around the globe, which is going to make our world a better place. Thank you. I have prepared a list of questions. Um, you need not, all of you, answer every question. Uh, we'll talk about it, and whoever wants to respond can respond. The first one you might all want to answer, and you need to keep your answers to two minutes. Okay? Okay. Good. Number one. What were the most significant issues you addressed as secretary? And we'll just go the other way. Ed? Uh, the most significant issue that I faced as secretary was the assurance of the American people that we had the safest, least expensive, and most abundant food supply in the world. We were under fire at USDA um, for um, animal um, uh, cruelty, um, for disease, for proper management of the nutrition and food in the world. And a lot of moms were worried about, are we really having safe food supply out there? We spent a lot of time making sure that we could prove to the American people that we did have that safe food supply and that it was secure and that it would be there for the people of the United States of America at an affordable price and one that would... That would um, you know, give them the security of their families and their homes and our neighborhoods. Thank you. Senator? Well, um, Ann was secretary when the cow stole Christmas, as we say. Uh, that was that uh, BSE animal, and uh, that transferred not only uh, to my time as secretary, but Ed, I'm sure you were working on that too, and to some extent we continue to work on that. Uh, th that occupied a lot of my time. Um, we, we had many, many countries, borders were closed, um, 
as was indicated in the introduction, we tried to move as quickly as we could to reopen borders, even from very small countries, just so we could get momentum going. Um, just recently, Japan moved to a more normalized state, as you know, where they're now taking beef from animals 30 months and, and younger. Before that, it was 20 months. So BSC occupied a lot of my time. Probably the second thing, though, was the Farm Bill proposal. Um, the uh, president was very anxious to get a comprehensive, total, complete farm bill out there, and that's what launched the um, listening sessions across the country. And the gratifying thing, farm bills ev are evolutionary, as you know. It's very rare that, that one just tears up the old one and starts over. They tend to build on the shoulders of the last one. It's gratifying to see how many of those proposals uh, were adopted and now are uh, even adopted. Some of the recommendations we made for conservation are, I think, likely to be in the next Farm Bill if we can get that to the finish line. So those would be the two that pop up as the most significant challenges we faced. And Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I served uh, as secretary at a time where we had it seemed like challenge after challenge of emergency type situations about a week after I came in, we had this huge outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Europe, which we were very worried that was going to come to the U.S. Of course, we then had 9-11, um, which was significant to all, all of the U.S. people and economy and in agriculture. We were looking at ways that where, where the biggest vulnerabilities would be in the food and agriculture system, from farms to processing plants. So that was among the most significant, of course. Um, we had outbreaks of exotic Newcastle disease the first time in 50 years that became a big emergency to deal with of bird flu. And then, of course, we had the cow who stole Christmas, as you pointed out, which was December 23rd, 2003, almost 10 years ago. Um, as I mentioned this afternoon, although we did have our export markets shut down, as we would have done to other countries if that had, if, if other countries got cases of BSE, they, they we were pretty much treated as we treat others. But we were able to keep enough confidence in the food safety system in this country that our beef consumption during that time never went down. Um, we also dealt with significant forest fires around the, the country. So it was like, it was as if we had crisis after crisis in those four years that I was there. But we also launched a Doha round um, and we um, held a significant uh, science and technology conference which brought together over a hundred countries to talk about the future of agriculture and how to use technology to feed the world in the future. And we had over a hundred ministers and, um, and so I think, um, you know, the, the issues you deal with are just so broad and, and, and so immense, um, but it certainly was an honor and a privilege to serve. Mike? Like uh, Ann, I also had a food emergency very, uh, very quickly into my administration, my, my term. Uh, first three days after I was sworn in, we had a young, young girl uh, who died from eating an undercooked hamburger. You might remember it was the Jack in the Box incident. And uh, I found out um, about the ravages of hemolytic uremic poisoning. Uh, e. coli 0015787, and uh, we had to move to contain it, investigate it, and uh, do what we could to institute reforms. But at the same time, we had to guarantee the image of agriculture to make sure that that stigma of adulteration uh, would not uh, give Americans and the world consumers a false perception of, uh, of our food. Uh, but uh, that that was an emergency, but I I want I had dinner with Bear Flinchball last night, and I I told a story, and he asked me to try to work it into this uh, London lecture. So this is about as good a time as any because sure. I may not speak again. Uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you got another minute. So uh, I can't. So uh, maybe a minute thirty seconds. Okay, so he, here here you go. Uh, during the um, during the first years of the Clinton administration, we were able to sign NAFTA and GATT you know, general agreement on tariffs and trade. It was signed, the Uruguay round was, uh, was signed. 
and I asked the president to allow me uh, to, uh, to negotiate the agricultural title. And uh, he, he said, okay, as long as I didn't screw it up. So I'd go to work and they'd give me a ticket to Marrakesh and Brussels and Geneva and, and, and South Korea and, and, and all of that. So we did it and tried to wrap it up. There was one country outstanding uh, that we, uh, uh, didn't, we, didn't have, we didn't make any progress on a, uh, a bilateral trade agreement, and that's Japan. Japan refused to import any U.S. rice, and their argument was that it was central to their economy. It was uh, cultural, iconic, uh, central uh, to their culture, and they just they would they would they would import more apples, or they'll do anything else uh, on their market access and on their quotas. But they would not import one grain of American rice into their country. It just would not happen. And that was the, the great void outstanding in what would otherwise would have been a very successful trade negotiation. So I got on a plane, flew to Tokyo, and I met with my counterpart, Minister Hata. And, uh, you know, we walked into this big room. You know, uh, usually, you know, you, you, you get off the planes, you fly all night, and, and you go and change and shower, then you go into these negotiation rooms. And uh, my delegation was pretty small. I had, I had Walter Mondale, who at that time was the ambassador to to Japan, and it was sitting on my right, and I had the the uh, one of my uh, interpreters, and the uh, one of my economists uh, on the left, and I had ten points to make, and uh, this story is not going to be as long as it was last night. I'm, I'm heard through it. However, they were just uh, I made ten points, and I thought I'd I thought I'd made them well. I thought I was articulate, and and they were just striking them down, striking them down, striking them down, striking them down, and uh, we had even had a the night before, I was staying in a high-rise Tokyo hotel, and there was a, a tremor of an earthquake. And I'd never, I'm from Mississippi, you know, <laughs> I'd, never, I'd never experienced the sway of that building before. And I, I said, okay, what I'll do tomorrow is lead into my thesis that uh, you can think that you're self-sufficient and that this is even a part of your national defense, but you're not immune from natural disasters. So I, I, I led off with that, and they struck it down. So I figure, okay, we've, we've lost this. We've got to go back to Washington, not having achieved any, any, uh, any success in, in this particular item. And uh, so I called it uh, a close. And so Mr. Hata wanted to entertain me, and uh, we were going to a banquet. And the banquet was across the hall from the negotiation room. So, you know, I'm feeling a little tired, and, and I'm angry. And they had my, none of my points uh, articulately made were ever considered. And, and so uh, I was going into the banquet room, and all of a sudden, someone tapped me on the shoulder, and uh, someone I really didn't recognize, because he had not been in any of our negotiations, and he invited me to a, an ante room off of, the, off of the, the main room there, the dinner uh, room. And I went into that room, and there was nobody in there but him, uh, the two of us. And I asked him, you know, you want me to go and get uh, the ambassador? Do you want me to go and get? He said, no, just you, just you. And uh, and he said, okay, you made 10 points, and we agree with, uh, we agree with them. And uh, he started ticking them off, and this gentleman was head of the Japanese food agency. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, and he's agreeing to everything. And I asked him, did I persuade him based on my logic or my intelligence? He said, no, no, he said, no. He says, what you guys don't know is our housewives are making us do this. <laughs> he says, your rice is better and it's cheaper <laughs> than ours. They want this long grain rice in, in our, and he said, that's why. And so I have a glass uh, a vase in my office and it says it's from the US Rice Federation. Uh, it's, it says it calls me the trade secretary. And, <laughs> and that is because we introduced rice, for, US rice for the first time into Japan. That's a great story, great story. Jack, you have to follow that. Oh, well, <clears throat> there's no question about it. Uh, all of us as secretaries faced a lot of challenges, and uh, uh, certainly when I was there, these were tough times. The, the early years in the 1980s, interest rates went through the roof. We lost a lot of farmers. Uh, the, the story I'll tell you about is uh, even before the President Ronald Reagan had been inaugurated, 
We were out, we went to Washington once. I was selected to a whole cabinet. We were out there in January. We had our first cabinet meeting, and it wasn't at the White House because he was not in there yet. Then he had a few members of the cabinet that gave presentations. He had two or three of them. And when he was done, when they were done, about ready to leave, he said, anybody else have anything they want to bring up? And I've, I've just been... I just been moving around and twitching the whole time, and I wanted to bring something up, and I put my hand up, naive as I was, and I just said that, Mr. President, you had said during your campaign that you would lift the trade embargo. There was a trade embargo at the time so that we could not export to the Soviet Union. There were the there were a great partner of ours. They bought all kinds of goods from us. They always paid cash on the barrel head. But we couldn't export there because President Carter had imposed an embargo. Interestingly enough, it's because they, the Soviet Union, had invaded Afghanistan. Now, of course, now, now we can't get the hell out of there fast enough, in my judgment. That's another story. Uh, anyway, uh, I about had my head taken off by the Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, and Cap Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense, and they were, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to do that. We've got to uh, extract some concessions from the Soviet Union. And so I left that meeting pretty depressed, but I, I found out from uh, Ed Meese and uh, two or three others, they said, well, we'll help you on this. We've got to get this done. And so we did start working on it, and in the meantime, the president got shot, and that kind of slowed things down quite a bit. <laughs> well, it, it, was, it was terrible. I just come in there, and I couldn't get anything done. And, and the newspapers were all writing up the fact that uh, Secretary Block's not getting anything done. He's probably gonna fail on I this one. I think I called for your resignation. Yeah, yeah. you probably <laughs> did. But so, any, sorry, anyway, uh, I, I had a, an audience with the president, and we got enough people working on this thing that finally he called me into uh, the Oval Office, and Alexander Haig was there, and he t right straight to me said, we're lifting the grain embargo today. And for American farmers, that was huge. Alexander Haig almost slumped back in his chair, but that's tough luck for him. Because <laughs> we lifted the grain embargo. We had a cabinet meeting right afterwards, immediately. We went into the cabinet room, and he told the cabinet, grain embargo's being lifted today. Now, they didn't know it until he told them. That was it, and that was one of the best moments. And we had some moments that weren't so great over those years because it was tough, but that was a good one, and that helped us. Because we already talked about how important trade is. Keep the trade channels open. And right today, we're negotiating trade with, with uh, the Pacific countries over, including uh, Asia. We're negotiating with Europe. We've got to be tough in those negotiations, but we need to get it done. Thank you. Dan, you can uh, finish it off. Mine is uh, perhaps not quite so serious. It's, it's uh, with all due respect to my colleagues here, but I was the most assaulted member of the cabinet. <laughs> and in fact, uh, I think Gordon Schmidt and others in the room have heard me tell this story before. But um, So the Secret Service changed their entire protective detail for cabinet members because of my um, uh, proclivity to get uh, things thrown at me. So um, first time it happened about six months after I took the job, and I went to the World Food Sum Summit in Rome and I was there, President Clinton, the Pope, Fidel Castro, they all spoke, and then the American delegation went into this room to have a news conference. It was very hot, we were sweating, and all of a sudden, in the front row, the entire two front rows of people stripped totally naked, and written on their bodies, uh, of course, I didn't look, but written on their bodies <laughs> were were no gene beans and the naked truth, and they threw genetically modified 
soybeans and um, other things at us. And so uh, this was, uh, you know, I, and I don't have a lot of hair, as you know, and so my, I was like sweating and these seeds were sticking to my forehead. <laughs> And, and so um, that night, uh, and the police came in, and, and, and uh, so they arrested the protesters, and that night um, uh, CNN did the whole thing, except in the U.S. they did it with big black stripes over the key portions of people's bodies, and, but not in Europe. So I get a call from, I get a call from my parents um, uh, in Wichita, and my mother says, this is terrible, this job is dangerous, I told you you shouldn't take this job. And then, you're, and then just a minute, your father wants to talk to you. And those of you who know my father, uh, he was a guy who saw the bright light in every situation. And his first question is, tell me, what did it look like? <laughs> okay. All right. Then, not too long later, honestly, about four months, I'm at a National Nutrition Summit in the Shoreham Hotel in Washington. And we're talking about nutrition. And I'm on the panel, I'm on the dais with Bob Dole and Secretary Shalala. And a woman starts cr screaming, Glickman, you're nothing but a pimp for the meat industry. And so she's running up, and she has a tofu cream pie in her hand. And she proceeds to get up close, and she throws it at me. I deftly duck, and it hits Shalala on the back. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to make of it, and so I quickly said to Dole, I said, Bob, I don't think we're in Kansas any longer. <laughs> and, then, and then the final thing, it happened about three months later, and we're in Yellowstone Park where, um, in Gardner, Montana, where uh, there is an effort to try to root out brucellosis, which is a disease that, where uh, the, ca the cattle got infected and they were spontaneously aborting and it was a terrible problem and so we were sent up to basically to cull uh, the number of bison that were there that had this disease. And so we're talking about what we're doing and all of a sudden a woman comes down and she's screaming and she's got a big pot of something and she says, you're killing my brothers, you're killing my sisters. And so one of the people on the panel with us was Senator Conrad Burns of uh, Montana. He was an old auctioneer and pretty funny guy and I said, what's going on? And she says, and he says, well, we got a problem. I, this is all happening like instantaneously. What's the problem? She thinks that those animals are her brothers and sisters. So she proceeded to throw infected buffalo guts at the whole table. And um, so all I could think about was is that I'm going to get a disease like malaria called undulant fever and I was going to have, have it the rest of my life. And my mother was right after all. So. Uh, I, I only tell you these stories. There were others that happened too. I only tell you these stories because uh, one thing I learned about this experience is, is that people feel very, very strongly about food, okay? <laughs> and these are matters they care about very much. And uh, while I'm giving you some of the perhaps the more extreme e evidences of what's going on here, what we do does impact people's lives. Every day, every place, all over the country, farmers, ranchers, consumers, business people, national government, national security, America's image in the world, and everything else, and it does make a difference. Well, you may have a hard time believing this, Dan, but this does lead into a serious question. <laughs> uh, Anne very eloquently talked about the uh, world hunger and the world food problem, and et cetera. So, a very blunt question. Is it any way possible to feed the world without biotechnology? There are people out there that think so. Is it possible? No. No? Why not? It, well, back to what I said. What do you do? You go back and farm the way my grandfather did with all the weeds and hoeing, all the labor it takes, look at all the extra chemicals Later on, they started using chemicals. We don't use the chemicals they use in Europe because we have biotechnology. Europe used 40%, 50% more chemicals than we do. And, and they can't keep the yields up with us. I mean, there's no way, uh, unless we invent something else that's better. And right now, we don't have anything that's better. I think it's, uh, you know, that's a short answer, but I, I just think it's ridiculous. But somehow, we've got to make sure that we rely on science, not on somebody's whim that you 
got to go back and farm the way uh, my grandfather did or the way they do it in Africa now. A lot of places over there don't have biotechnology. They don't even have hybrid seeds and they don't have the, what they need to raise a big crop. And if we're going to feed the world, we're going to have to raise a big crop in a lot of places, not just in Illinois and Kansas. I would agree, but with this one proviso, there is no silver bullet to feeding a, a world of larger numbers of people. There's silver buckshot, I call it. There's a lot of answers. If you go into East, I was in Ethiopia just in a April, and, and if you go to a lot of these countries, I mean, what they really need more than GM seeds, and I'm for them, by the way, I think it's an important part of the equation, is they need modern techniques, modern fertilizers, they, uh, they, they need uh, to deal with the issue of waste, which Ann talked about. Uh, they, they need to deal with cons modern conservation tillage practices. I mean, and, and, and you know, about 75% of the people who are farming in Africa are women, and they, and, you know, they, they need to, to understand new marketing techniques, how to use cooperatives much better. So we just can't take this issue and just overlay it on everything and say it's the only answer, or in many cases, the primary answer. Now, I do agree with you that we're not going to be able to deal with the water issue, we're not going to be able to deal with the pest issue, uh, and we're not going to be able to deal with disease and weather and climate without using new technologies, including genetic engineering. Um, and we got to talk about the trade-offs involved if we don't do this kind of thing, which we haven't as well. I would say this, however, if I were the food industry, I would be looking at ways that we could develop techniques and traits of food that average consumers could see would benefit them. Right now, most of the discussion of biotechnology is how it affects production agriculture, which is fine. But you're seeing a growing movement in this country of people who want to know what's in their food. And a lot of people who do that really are against biotechnology and genetic, genetically modified foods. But we, we, if, if we could get more evidence that these traits are improving nutrition and, in, 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 and improving diet and doing things that not only help production agriculture but also help consumers, I think it would go a long way to remove a lot of the uncertainty there's out there about this subject. Anybody else want to comment? No, I'd offer a, a couple of comments. Um, the, I think, uh, Dan, you make a very valid point here, and, and Jack does too. But here's the point. Kansas-style agriculture or Nebraska style, or Illinois style, or whatever state you want to mention, does not necessarily work in every part of the world. It's just a different phenomena. Um, like I said, I just got back from, from Africa. Africa. We were in Ethiopia, Rwanda, Liberia. We even spent a little bit of time over in the Congo, which is really a mess. And you could change the world there with hybrid seed and fertilizer and water management. You could change the world with just better planting practices. Uh, one of the things that they found out, they grow a crop there and they spread it. And so it kind of grew up like uh, wheat or something. They came to learn that if they took that, that crop and put it in rows, their yield doubled. Now, why did they spread it instead of putting it in rows? Because they, their father did it that way, their grandfather did it that way, their great-grandfather did it that way. As long as anybody could ever remember, they spread it. Well, when you start changing things on that scale, you make a world of difference. The other thing I'd say about this, too, is that uh, I'm a believer in, in biotechnology. I was the chair of the Governor's Coalition on Biotechnology. I could give you all the credentials. But I will offer this. Number one, we have to really get good at the science. That's where K-State comes in and the University of Nebraska and other land-grant institutions. We've got to be the best. And we have to understand that when we send a product into the marketplace, we're going to put our seal of approval on that product from a safety standpoint, et cetera. 
The second thing I would say is that no matter how hard we try to convince people, they're not going to be convinced. And this is what I say to young people. I love all kinds of agriculture. Heck, I loved it when we milked 30 cows and feraled 12 sows at a time. But I appreciate that's a hobby farm today. Now that fed four kids and two adults, but you're not farming that way anymore. As much as I might love that in, in pine for those days again, I appreciate those days have ended. And we've got a growing population. We've got to deal with it. But what I say to young kids is there are so many opportunities in agriculture. Maybe you want to do organic. God bless you. There's a market for it out there. Maybe you want to do something different. Maybe you want to do hormone-free beef. God bless you. There's a market out there for you. And on and on. And so what I would say is celebrate all aspects of agriculture from the very large operations that we're used to to the very small operations that maybe are the organic farmer who's selling at farmer's markets or whatever because there's opportunity in all parts of agriculture and we should, we should say that's outstanding and it is. But there's got to be room for all parts of agriculture, not just one segment. And you probably have the most experience on this panel in terms of food policy. Uh, what dietary changes do you see coming, and how will it affect people's eating habits? Dietary changes in terms of the dietary guidelines, or? Yes. Well, I mean, I think we had a new set of dietary guidelines. I mean, continually we see the dietary guidelines focus on the need for um, more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, um, a healthier lifestyle in terms of um, exercise. Um, you know, we've seen a lot, I, I mean, I, I think we've seen a, a lot of focus now because of the severe problem of obesity in this country and around the world. Um, we, we, Dan Glickman and I uh, have co-chaired an initiative through the Bipartisan Policy Council looking at the cost to health care of obesity in this country. Um, and, you know, there's so many implications in addition to the health care costs. I mean, 25% of the people in this country who apply to go in the military can't get in because they're too overweight. Um, so it's affecting national security. But I think we're making progress. We're seeing some decline in, in childhood obesity rates right now. There was, was some slight good news coming out. We've seen some changes to the school lunch program which I think are positive results in terms of really looking at how do you help children eat healthier. There's some very good examples of cities who have worked with new kinds of uh, food companies that are preparing healthier foods that kids want to eat. Um, I think education of children on eating is, is absolutely critical. Um, and I think that, that, you know, as we go forward, we have, you know, a lot of this controversy over, you know, what people are eating, and I absolutely agree that we have to look at, you know, all kinds of agriculture, and men, much of that is consumer-driven. The consumers are asking for, you know, more connectivity with where their food comes from, whether it's local food or organic food. We see a huge increase in the, the amount of, um, of, of local food, and driven a lot by the restaurant industries. We see the you know, the emergence of stores like Whole Foods um, and um, more and more certification programs, whether it's fair trade or organics. So I think, as Senator Johans has said, I mean, we have to really look at agriculture and the breadth of what it is, what it represents, and we have to focus on nutrition and how to get nutrition to people and that connectivity of nutrition and the health of the human being. Uh, Barry, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, Mike, go ahead. ahead. Uh, i like to weigh in on this just one second. Uh, and uh, we, we talked earlier about the farm bill being a problem because the uh, food nutrition title was delinked or taken out of it. 
and uh, we talked about also it, it taken out because principally because of the the uh, ballooning cost of it based on uh, entitlements and those who qualify for SNAP program food stamps. And uh, I don't want to I I I, uh, I echo everything that uh, Anna Veneman said. Uh, associate myself with her regarding the uh, high rates of obesity. I am from the state of Mississippi. Unfortunately, every uh, socioeconomic index, when it comes to those kinds of things, we tend to be <coughs> at the bottom, and we've got to do something about it. So, to me, the um, we have a reform idea, which some may consider is uh, a bit controversial. I've certainly not come into the Landon Lecture trying to, you know, become controversial. However, uh, I, 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 I think it's reasonable to experiment as to whether or not we could remove some of the snack foods from the, uh, from the SNAP program. Those foods that are uh, high in calories, high in salt, fat, trans fats, uh, some of the high fructose corn syrup drinks, uh, perhaps uh, when it comes to the use of the public tax dollar at the supermarket to be spent on things that are that are that we know uh, do not uh, perpetuate the best health outcomes uh, those products just like tobacco and just like beer you can't you can't uh, you can't buy those products and and get them paid for with food stamps we would we would give some consideration to removing or making some of these foods ineligible for use in the snap program now it doesn't mean they can't buy them they can use their own private dollars, uh, discretionary dollars for those those types of foods, uh, but uh, I think that should be considered. And uh, you know, it may I don't want some may indict this for an infringement on personal choice. Uh, not something I'm trying to do here, but honestly, when we know uh, as a nation that they are negative and deleterious health effects for foods like this, and to have them uh, included in the food basket. Uh, that we keep paying for that, and we keep paying for the negative health outcomes um, uh, or with regard to obesity and, and the rest, that, that this is something to consider. Are then uh, the savings on these types of products that now are ineligible, perhaps we could add a, a, a half percent bonus uh, for the purchase of fruits and vegetables. So, the, uh, uh, so we've tried persuasion, we've tried education, and that's working. But now we might need to take more stringent measures. Uh, Dan? I just want to, uh, first of all, I agree with both what Ann and Mike said, but I have to tell you two personal vignettes. As USD, running this Department of Agriculture, we had the authority on what's called Section 29. 32. 32. 32. Well, that was 32. Uh, three less. I had, 20, I had 29, close. and tw I wasn't there very long. But anyway, uh, 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 <laughs> but, but anyway, it, I was there six years. But anyway, um, the... Um, when there was a crop or a product in oversupply, we had the ability to go in the marketplace and buy it. And it was unlimited. It was almost, it was a totally unlimited power. So um, I'm just thinking about this because these problems are, I, while I agree with Mike, these problems are a little more complicated than you think. So one day I get a call from Senator Stevens, who was a very, very powerful center of the Appropriations Committee, and he prevailed on us to buy millions of dollars of canned salmon for the school lunch program because uh, there was an oversupply of salmon. Now I can tell you that there is one thing that school kids will not eat, <laughs> canned salmon. So we bought it, and remember Forrest Gump when they had broiled shrimp, sliced shrimp, diced shrimp? Well we did broiled salmon, sliced salmon, Boxed salmon, anything we could, and I think we still have that salmon 12 years later. Okay. Then, Senator, another colleague of uh, Senator Moran and, and uh, Senator Johans, Senator Carl Levin, called and he says, We got a lot of cherries. What are we going to do with all these cherries? And he, I'm sure you all had similar examples. So, we bought lots and lots of cherries for the school lunch program. Now, let me tell you what we did with them. We dried them, we fried them, we mixed them, um, we mixed them with hamburger meat, we mixed them with canned salmon, even. Okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> and and, and uh, I think that we served about three portions and none in Kansas, I want to tell you that. 
So I, I, you know, my point in all this is, is that um, the, the obesity problem is really serious, and what Mike says is true. We, we probably ought to begin looking at these issues of, of uh, these are taxpayer funds and what people ought to be buying with them, and if there's a way to improve their health. But you know, fundamentally, a lot of these issues are taste, preference, and culture. And sometimes they're difficult items to really get people to change their behavior with. No question. No question. Anybody else want to comment? Uh, just, Jack? Just one word on this. I agree with Mike. I think the federal government contributes towards obesity. If there are 50 million people getting food stamps now and all of the checks and people that are looking things over realize that there are more obese people in that group than there are the other group that's not getting food stamps. I've seen these kind of studies. Yeah, but, but no, I no, don't. You can't complain now. I've got another solution. Yeah. That's the first thing. I agree. More fruits and vegetables and meat even, but not stuff that makes them fat. Then the, the other thing is we've got kids that are obese and they're, 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 they're going to school and they get free lunches and they have big lunches for them. I've got an idea here. The way you deal with that is you weigh them in. <laughs> and, if, and if the kids are too heavy, they, don't, they, they, don't go, to no, they go to the vegetable line and fruit and vegetables. Oh. <laughs> that, and, and if they're not too heavy and they're just right, they can go get, you know, they can get biscuits and gravy. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's look, my I'm, solution. This is from a personal freedom. You just heard that. I'm, I'm a, <laughs> well, the government, can, the government can dictate this because we're giving the money out. It's not that, it's not that yeah, we're but, taking something away from someone. Can I just, can I just comment on this? <laughs> we got it stirred now, and so you. Um, well, first of all, I mean, we have to recognize that I think what Mike Espy said is is right. We have to look at these issues. Is the government paying for food that is actually contributing then on the other end to our health care costs? I think the other thing we have to think about is a few years back, the, the name of this program was changed from the food stamp program to the supplemental nutrition yes. assistance yes. program. That ought to be taken into account. We, we debated these issues a lot during our report, and, the, and, and one of the things we realized is how politically sensitive some of these issues are. So one of the things we noted in our report was that, you know, this is a time where everybody wants information, big data, and transparency on everything. And yet we don't have any publicly available data on what people buy with, food, with the SNAP program or the food stamp program. So one of the things we called for in our report was let's, at f let's first of all get that data. Um, second of all, there's been, many of you have heard about things that go on in the place where I live, the other Manhattan uh, in New York City and what Mayor Bloomberg do has done on, on soft drinks. But what, he didn't start with that. He went, f he went first to try to get them taxed, but then he went to the USDA and, and asked for a pilot program exemption. And I think the other way politically to start this process to see if there can be um, some of the programs along the line that my guest be talking about is, is to begin some pilot programs. And other states have asked for this as well. And, Perhaps this is a way to begin to look at whether what policy would make sense in this regard. And I want to tell my friend Jack Block that uh, he needs a good lawyer when he tries to take a kid out. Of the, hey, 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 I'll be your lawyer. No, I, I, oh, you're going to be the lawyer. I, I'm, I'm not running for office. <laughs> well, I think we've probably sufficiently covered that subject. Um, should we? continue to provide a safety net under farm income like we've done since 1933? Should we continue that yes. or not? Yes, but it should be more focused on risk management, which we're doing, and uh, on, on true natural disasters. And uh, we are entering, I believe, an era of much stronger farm prices, farm income, 
and uh, the just sending out of checks to, to farmers uh, is one that's under great uh, review right now. And the Senate bill has dealt with that issue by dealing with trying to reduce direct payments. But we'll, we should not take this in, as an opportunity to go down the road to get rid of farm programs. That's a real bad mistake in my mind. I, I, I think the history of the world shows that we're always going to need some government support for agriculture. It's been true since the time of, of the Bible and Exodus when we had you know, storage programs to help people during periods of, of big surpluses and as well as tight supplies. And so, but I think that the programs ought to be more geared towards risk management and away from just providing checks to producers. Ed, do you want to yes, comment I think, on that? You know, I think that one of the things we tend to forget uh, when we're talking about agriculture policy in a farm program is the fact that with, with disease and weather problems and this and that, um, farmers can be impacted through no fault of their own. Um, and so, you know, we, we want to make sure that we keep the production capacity out there, keep agriculture in business, so to speak, so that we keep agriculture and food security in the United States. If you look at parallel to the energy um, that we see today, although it's getting better, um, you know, we, we didn't take care of our energy um, industry and that sector of the economy in the United States and it was pushed offshore and we became dependent on other countries for our energy. We do not want to become dependent on other countries for our food. That would be a bad idea and we need to have some kind of a, a program that is an assurance, um, an insurance program, um, a disaster payment program, something that keeps farmers in business when they get hailed out, washed out, diseased out, uh, through no fault of their own. I mean, we, we just need to provide that security and strength for the agriculture uh, sector of the economy in our country. Mike? Um, it's an interesting question, um, especially happening here, and I, I'll share something with you. Um, one of the most forward uh, leaning thinking people in the United States Senate on this issue comes from this state. Pat Roberts. Um, back in the day when he was uh, chair of the uh, House Ag Committee, uh, he was working this issue. And his concept really has become the foundation for discussion now. And basically, I, I often refer to Pat as, as the father of the modern crop insurance program. When I became Secretary of Agriculture, I think corn prices were two bucks a bushel. And you saw what that got us. It was not a good system. We had, uh, we had the counter-cyclical program, we had the marketing loan program, we had the direct payments, and quite honestly, it was, it was moving farmers away from a thoughtful view of how best to manage their operations. And then there was a point in farm policy history where we told you what to plant. The federal government literally dictated what you plant. Can you possibly imagine that these days? I mean, if, I think if we tried to do that today, we'd have open rebellion uh, in rural America. So what we have now is a more risk management approach to agriculture, and that's basically what we're saying. We're saying, Last year, when we have drought across the Corn Belt, we're going to have a crop insurance program. And that makes sense to people. And we can sell that in town. It makes sense to the farmer. We can sell it in town. And the thing I like about it is everybody has skin in the game. The farmer's paying premiums. Uh, the federal government participates in this. And people understand natural disasters. But there's a big debate going on because as you move south, so, sorry, Mike Espy, but they like their, they like their direct payments, they like their counter-cyclical program, they like their marketing loan program, and so you get this constant knocking of heads between southern agriculture and Midwest agriculture. And any of you who have participated in national ag organizations knows that this is the case. We just got to keep working on this because we can't defend these programs. 
I've been telling farmers in Nebraska for the last two, three years, direct payments are gone. If we ever get a farm bill done, don't go to your banker and tell them the direct payments are gonna be there because they're not. And I didn't get any pushback from Nebraska farmers on that. No one said, well, we still need direct payments. Nobody said that. I really believe where we need to be is what was envisioned years ago, and it literally came out of Pat here in Kansas. He joined forces with a Nebraska Senator Bob Kerry, and it became what is today the modern crop insurance program, which is working very, very well for us. And we just need to protect that program as we think about getting this farm bill done. Let's take this out further. And then we'll go to the audience for questions. Obviously, one of the things that's driving the Farm Bill debate uh, is the budget. And we've just w gone through a god-awful experience over shutting the government down and a debt ceiling debate. Why has Washington become so dysfunctional, and what can we do about it? I, I gave you the solution during my opening statement. I, I, I said uh, everyone gets into the shower together. And that, <laughs> there you but, go. But those were in the days before there weren't very many women in the Congress, right? I was Separate showers. Separate showers. Right. Why? Why well, separate showers? Yeah. No, that's not the question. <laughs> you know, you need to be careful. Uh, Why well, is it so dysfunctional? You know, a uh, hundred years ago, Mark Twain said there was only one true criminal class in America, and that's Congress. So yeah. in some sense, things haven't changed all that yeah. much. I, I do think it is probably worse today than it was before. And I don't think there's one simple solution. I think there's 24-hour media, which is generally not objective and not reporting the news, but uh, reporting uh, in ideological perspectives. On the right, if you watch Fox, and on the left, if you watch MSNBC, and on the radio, for all of the above. I think the amount of money in politics is, is embarrassing, that members of Congress spend 50, 60, 70 percent of their time raising money and don't have the time to do their jobs, I think that that's a lot different than when I first came to the place in 1977. And I suspect Mike Johans has some thoughts about that, you know, himself as well. Um, I think that a lot of times leadership doesn't act like leadership is supposed to act to, that people get very nervous about uh, the safety of their races and you know, I mean, I, look, look let, let's be, I, I lost in 1994. You know, I lost. I thought it was the most terrible thing that ever happened to me, and it's turned out I've had the best life that I could ever imagine in my life. You know, it, was, it wasn't the end of the world. And um, so... Um, you uh, wouldn't have been secretary. I wouldn't have been no, secretary, no. But, but, be, but be that as it may, you know, uh, it's, it's um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that the... The, the whole country is a bit less civil as well. I mean, you look at the content on television and, and in, in, in the general media, and it's, and it's harsher than it used to be as well. And I, so the public picks that up. And you go to town hall meetings, and it's harsh. People are nastier than they used to be. I mean, it's, so I don't think there's, I mean, look, I think most members of Congress are honorable people, want to do the right thing. I think the system is, is difficult. I think there are some problems in the system. And as I said, I think money, the excess of money, money is the, as Sam Rayburn once said, money is the mother's milk of politics. But it's become the cottage cheese and the yogurt and the, and the, and the, and the, and the tofu cream pie and everything in between, you know? So, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, I, I, it's, it's something that I, I, but we're all in this together. We've got to have a country that works well. I think it was Mike or Ann that talked about what the rest of the world looks at us when we, when we shut down our government, when we 
don't pay our bills. I mean, we're the strongest country in the world. We don't act like that in America. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have problems, and we, we do have a terrible deficit that, that has to be dealt with, but we, we got to act like mature, responsible people who are fiduciaries of the public. And if we don't act that way, we're going to become a second-rate power, and I don't want to see that happen. I don't think anybody else does. Mike, you're the only one yeah, I'm that the one holds public there. office at the moment. Uh, I will, I'll offer a couple of uh, brutally honest assessments here. If I were a Kansas resident, and I've been in this place in my home state of Nebraska, and I wanted to be your mayor of Manhattan or Kansas City or whatever, or I wanted to be your governor, and I ran on a platform and I said, and ladies and gentlemen, I want to assure you that if I do not get my way, I will shut the government down. Think about that. What would the impact of, on K-State be? What would be the impact on your schools that get a major portion of their funding and I could go on and on. And you know, I've been in that position. You see, I never thought I had that option. I think that is unbelievable. Now, there are certain things that have happened in the last five years that break my heart. I think this health care bill is just the absolute worst. But part of the ownership has to be on the, on the country, too. We need reinforcements in the Senate. The House can repeal that every day. If they want to vote on that every day, they can repeal it. But the last time I checked, 45 votes in the Senate doesn't get you very far if you want to repeal something. And so I just think that's as brutally honest as I can be about the last couple of weeks. I just think at the end of the day, you've got to fight wisely and strategically and in the best interests of the country. That would be number one. The second thing I would offer is this. You know, as I was looking across those young people today, those beautiful kids that you raised in this state, that, as I said, remind me so much of the kids back in Nebraska. You know, they grow up on ranches and farms, and they've got great values. They're conservative by nature. They've been raised that way. Gosh, I hope in that room we have school board members. I hope we have members of the trustees of your local church. I hope we have somebody who's a future United States senator. Maybe there's somebody in there who will be the next president of the United States uh, or be president of the United States someday. But boy, if we, just, if we continue to destroy our belief in our ability to govern ourselves, then how are you ever going to get those young people to do these jobs? And I think that would be a tragic loss for our future. I, you know, I'm going to leave public service, and I'm going to, to continue to believe, like the first day I ran for office, that this is a profession that has great merit and can tremendously improve the lives of, it, of its citizens. But ladies and gentlemen, it's got to work. Um, I mean, flirting with your, your full faith and credit, please. I mean, I don't like the $17 trillion worth of debt in it. You know, if I ever get in power, we're gonna fix that. <laughs> because you know how we're gonna fix it? <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna talk to you about entitlements my Social Security and Medicare, which I'm just a couple of years away from. That's where the spending's at. You know why we don't talk about that much? Because it's a surefire way to get unelected. Nobody wants to talk about giving up their, their benefits, but quite honestly, that's where you gotta talk. We can hammer K-State till the cows come home. We can cut research, we can cut all of these discretionary spending programs, and there isn't enough there to make any difference. But that's what we're doing year after year after year. And we're paying a very heavy price for it. Let's get real and honest and have a adult conversation, a very honest conversation about where the spending is at. And it's 
I tell people back home in Nebraska, I'm your problem. And they go, yeah, we voted for you, you know. <laughs> but I am. I'm a baby boomer. I'm smack dab in the middle. And all of these years, somebody has been saying, you're going to get Medicare and Social Security, and if you're poor, you're going to get Medicaid. Of course. That's very costly. And you know what? Final thing I'll say about this. I could really get ramped up on this. I am two years away from Medicare. Why in the world should my kids, who are struggling to make their house payment, provide daycare for their two children, why should they be paying for my medical care? Does that make any sense to a single person in this room? I'm not the wealthiest person in the Senate, but I can sure as heck afford my medical care. And if I'm going to pay it versus Michaela paying it, this is not a close call. Just tell me what I got to do. Just be honest. And I think that's the kind of conversation this nation needs more of. And we need a whole lot less of elect me and I'll shut down your government because we will pay a heavy price for that. That is dangerous. That is dangerous. If I don't get my way, I'm going to shut down your government and jeopardize our full faith and credit. I don't like that message. And I'm as conservative and as Republican as the next person we owe you better than that. If that's the best we can come up with, that's not very good. We owe you better than that as United States citizens. We do have a few minutes for some audience questions. And we have microphones on the right and the left. And uh, so we would certainly ask, if you'd like to ask a question, to go and line up. We'll do questions for about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, so we'll go ahead and start over here. Yes, sir. My name is Ron Klitaski, and I work in wildlife conservation. And I haven't heard very much this evening about conservation of our land and, and uh, natural habitats. Uh, an organization recently published a paper indicating that Almost more than 23 million acres of grassland, wetland, and shrubland was converted to uh, agriculture between 2008 and 2011. And I'm concerned that with the high subsidies for crop insurance and the big push for ethanol, that we may lose, as well as looking forward to try and feed 9 billion people in the world, are we going to lose all of our prairies and wetlands and all of our natural habitats uh, in this country as one of the costs? Jack? That's a good question. Uh, I may not answer it completely, but uh, when I was Secretary of Agriculture, that's when we started the Conservation Reserve Program. And I think it's, it's helped a lot in conserving a lot of our soil. And we still have it in place. What, with the demand for food, we have plowed up some of that land. But they've been very careful on what could be plowed up and let back into production. Uh, the more fragile land is still in the Conservation Reserve Program. And uh, I think we have to accept the fact that uh, there will be maybe, maybe not just in the United States. Look at the world there may be more land coming into production. You go down to Brazil, they're plowing up land. And, you know, with the growing demand for food, it's probably going to happen. But we are doing a far better job today, even though we're cropping land of conserving the soil, because we have a lot of no-till farming, minimum tillage, I, I, a lot of uh, waterways and filter strips I just happen to think we're doing a whole lot better job than we used to do, but I think we're going to probably continue to probably see land uh, plowed up and put into crop production, and I don't know how we're going to change that. Ed? Um, yeah, I, I, I also think it's a great question. It's something that we very much need to deal with. You know, the United States Department of Agriculture has a conservation or environmental index on every acre of property in this country. 
and you know where the issues are, where you could have productive, good, have good productive land, and where we have areas of wetlands and streams and buffer zones and things that need to be kept. The problem that we have today is the, f it's been very clear that the federal government top-down big taxpayer support is not available anymore. Our country's broke, we don't have the money, the programs aren't available. And we need to learn in this country how to deal with uh, market-based solutions, private sector solutions that are voluntary for producers, farmers, ranchers, and landowners out there to keep the conservation efforts going. Um, former Secretary of Interior Gail Norton and myself recently started the Conservation Leadership Council, uh, which is focused exactly on that. And the focus is, um, again, to, you know, to look at local solutions, proven, acceptable, deliverable solutions, not delivered by the largesse of government, but delivered by the private sector on voluntary participation basis. And I think, really, conservation in this country is going to move into that arena because it is the only way that we're going to continue to preserve and conserve the lands that are so valuable to us. I just add that one That's issue that point. you are going to have to deal with in the Farm Bill is, is that if we're going to have a, con a risk management system, if you're going to have a crop insurance system that's very heavily subsidized by the government, then the question is, should farmers be required who take advantage of those uh, crop insurance policies, but required to take do uh, conservation compliance? And that's an issue I think the Senate dealt with. In my judgment, if you're going to get, if that's going to be the farm program of the future, there, it's reasonable to say if you're going to get heavily subsidized crop insurance that you ought to have uh, participate in crop and in, in conservation compliance. Which is why, which is my, why I made the point that it should be voluntary, not forced on by government. I, I disagree with you. I mean, I, I think if we're going to get it delivered, government isn't the solution. You know, private producers landowners, farmers, and ranchers on a voluntary basis with policy that allows them to create value from those conservation efforts are what's going to make it happen. If we can, let's go ahead and do another question over here. Yes, sir. I'm Tucker Stewart, the president of the Washburn Agricultural Law Society, and uh, I think my question comes near and dear to all uh, uh, the young people in here who plan on uh, taking over a family farm or hanging their own shingle and, and purchasing a farm. Um, considering, you know, the old adage, farmers live poor but die very rich, uh, the aging population of, of the current farm household, the cost of production, price of land, and all these, uh, I guess, monetary barriers, uh, what are current U.S. agriculture policies that can help encourage new farmers from, from, for, to hang their own shingle and I guess what are some areas that we can expand to, to, uh, to, to better serve the, the young people? Um, I'd offer a couple of thoughts about that and everything you mentioned is absolutely on target. Um, if you were a young person today without some kind of family entry point, uh, family support, it'd be nearly impossible to get started and it just seems to get worse. We offered a number of different things in the farm propo proposal, farm bill proposal I did as secretary. Uh, we improved the loan situation. Uh, we expanded that. Uh, for beginning farmers, we also had a provision where uh, we were actually going to boost the farm program for them. Um, to, and back then, we were, it was designed as an incentive to try to get young people into farming. Um, the, the challenge we're going to continue to face, though, is um, I think Dan's right. I think there's going to be greater demand for agricultural products in the future. We'll have some peaks and valleys, no doubt about it. Greater demand, cash rents go up, um, you know, ag land values go up, everything, and it just makes it tougher and tougher. But I do think there are some opportunities in terms of the uh, USDA beginning farmer programs in literally locking in on those young people. And in, in, like I said, it could be loans, it could be improvements in uh, the crop insurance program, could be a whole host of strategies that would help some. But I think far and away these days, 
young people going into farming or ranching, they need a supportive parent or uncle or neighbor or something like that that's going to ease them into it because the capital, co the capital costs are so high. Anybody else want to take a stab at that? Okay, over here. Uh, thanks, Chuck Rice, uh, soils professor here at K-State. Uh, first, I'd like to comment as former president of the Soil Science Society of America, I'd like to thank Secretary Glickman and Block for mentioning soil. Um, but my question is, uh, Senator, you mentioned the value, since we're at K-State and was one of the first land-grant universities, you mentioned the value of uh, uh, educating students and science of agriculture. But my question is the funding for those activities is basically flat. Uh, Secretary Veneman also mentioned health nutrition and the tie-in, but if you look at funding across the sciences and uh, NIH budgets have doubled, but ag sciences funding for that and research and extension have basically flat and maybe even declined. And I got students, PhD students, they won't go, they don't want to go into ag research because they see it's too difficult to get competitive grant funding or get grant funding. How do you I guess resolve the issue of recruiting students into agriculture where the funding has been declining. Professor, this is a teachable moment and I just can't <laughs> pass up the opportunity to use this great opportunity you've given to us because I won't dispute anything you are saying. And keep in mind, folks, we're under sequester now. So if we don't get the budget levels down by January 15th or actually 15 days after we adjourn the session, so be about mid-January. The sequester is just a fancy Washington word of saying everybody gets across the board cut to get to the caps that were agreed upon in the Budget Control Act two years ago. Who's affected by those caps? Uh, that gentleman there standing at the podium, and our president, and I could go on and on. Uh, Doctors are affected by those caps in terms of uh, Medicare patients. Um, we are inundated, uh, head start, on and on. What do all of these various programs have in common? They're in the discretionary part of the federal budget, and they're getting the full brunt of those. Now, five programs in the federal budget constitute over 80% of the spending. You know what they are? Medicare. Medicaid, Social Security, National Defense, and interest on the debt. Now, if I come here tonight and I tell you, you know, you, you really need to be proud of me as your United States Senator. I'm going to pay the interest on the debt. I'm going to have a strong national defense. I'm going to protect your Social Security benefits, your Medicare benefits, and provide Medicaid to the poor. I've now made it absolutely mathematically possible to get anywhere near balancing the federal budget. I've just pulled the wool over your eyes, and you know what? That's just about as honest as I can be. The way we are going to come to grips with this, I believe, is finally come to grips with where the spending is at. And if we don't do that, then what you're asking about, there's a very bright future there. Again, I'm just being candid. Now, some of you might be sitting out there saying, well, my simple solution to this is more revenue, just raise taxes. Well, keep in mind, there was a pretty significant tax increase at the end of the year because the, the 12 years of those favorable rates expired for that high income. And we got tens of billions of dollars of new revenue. Did it solve the problem? Yeah. No. The problem is we're spending faster than our economic engine can provide the revenue to pay for it. We just have to deal with these issues and deal with them realistically, or every time your president talks about the federal government, his hair will be turning gray because it is the discretionary programs that are getting cut. And that's just the reality of the situation. We've got to have real reform of our budget process, our entitlement programs. We've just got to get real about what we're dealing with. That is the answer to your question. And I wish it was simpler than that, but it's not simpler than that. We've got to get, get, to, uh, get to these issues or 
boy, it's just going to get worse. Is, Way to mid-January. He's absolutely telling the truth. Absolutely telling the truth. I served on the House Ooh. Budget Committee. And, uh, you know, we have these forecasts, and you just see the onslaught of the impact of entitlement programs. And yet the political will is never there, never registered to begin a serious conversation to trimming them. And we know why. We just know why. Uh, it's just not politically expedient to do it. And so we focus all of our attention on going after the small bore discretionary titles. And they're just getting killed. And uh, now going back to research, I will say something on that. You know, research dollars are uh, under duress like most of the other uh, discretionary dollars. But there are programs and there are opportunities beyond federal research dollars that you could, uh, the students here at K-State could avail themselves of. And I mentioned this earlier today, so I don't need to go through it, but John, John Block and I are involved in a program now uh, in uh, third world countries. And you know, we've talked about water and soils and so forth. I'll just tell you, to the students in particular at K-State, I would look to Africa. And if you look and see what's going on in Africa right now, Saudi Arabia is now placing contracts on, on water in, in, in some of the countries on the continent of Africa. And China is really using their um, available dollars to, to, to uh, build, build dams and bridges and large infrastructure projects in return for uh, trade with those African countries. They are abundant in water, soils, minerals. And what John Block and I are trying to do is not just do humanitarian missions feeding uh, African nations, but what we, just, what we try to do is build the competence and capacity of small-scale African farmers. Why are we doing that? Because we know that in America we are so incredibly proficient technologically that uh, our production will continue to outstrip our domestic demand. And so we have to find new markets and emerging markets and outlets to sell our farm products to. And I would just say Africa as a continent has been overlooked. And so if we spend our time trying to impress those small scale African farmers, then we can impress them with our technology. And then when they raise their incomes, they're gonna have more, uh, they're gonna change their consumption habits to more proteins. Uh, they're going to, when they need tractors, when they need seeds, then they're gonna look to America first. So what we've been trying to do through a USAID program is right now to go in, not just with humanitarian feeding, because we're all doing that church missions, and, and God bless them, we still need to do that. But at some point, we need to address the competence issues to elevate their incomes so that they be can become more like middle-income consumers and they buy from us because we've been there, and our, our seeds are great, our tractors are great, and our outreach is good. I just make a couple points. Um, by the way, I think what Mike and John are doing are really terrific. But I want to make a point. The question is, is there the will there ever be the political will in this country to do what you just talked about, Mike? Ever. And um, will you in this room, will the public, will you give your politicians slack to make reasonable decisions along these lines? Because ultimately, the decisions are the people's. Not, not the politicians, and, and um, you know, the politicians are only as strong as you are. And so I, I, I really think that, you, you know, what you're talking about is something very reasonable. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to solve our budget deficit problem. It takes hard work and some political courage. And the second thing I'd say is we've all worked for presidents of the United States. And I'll be honest with you, none of the presidents we've worked for have shown great courage in leading the effort to help solve these problems. I, uh, I, I, with one exception, I will say, and that's President Clinton. He did a pretty good job at that. We had a balanced budget when he left. Now, the economy was growing stronger. Granted, you know, things were doing better. But we had, we had an effective budget control process, and things tended to work very well. President Obama had the opportunity by accepting the Bull Simpson proposal to move ahead on trying to, uh, trying to reach some consensus. And uh, in my judgment, he dropped the ball on that one. And I'm sorry that he did. So, so 
uh, the president has some responsibility in this too, but the real responsibility lies in the people and the voters of this country. I, I want to say something about this, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with you and, and Mike down there, uh, but there's just a little bit I would add to it. I don't know how we're going to fix this if we keep giving goodies out to people, giving them money. For, I don't care whether it's food stamps, farm programs, money for this, buying more uh, military equipment, and then everybody, you know, they're going to get reelected if they're able to help their constituents. Effectively, the, the politicians are buying votes all the time by giving away money. And by giving out stuff and money, they buy votes. Now, they don't want to not get voted back into office. They want to be voted into office. So the, the more, more they can give away, the more secure they are. This is a problem. I, uh, democracy, our country's terrific. But we're on kind of a slippery slope, in my judgment, with the government getting so big and having so many handouts to so many people. And boy, it is hard to take it back. Uh, let, let me, I, I, I apologize to the folks who are lined up for questions, but I, I just want to say back to the, can we develop the public will to do what needs to be done? I think the answer is yes. And I would turn to the North Dakota experience uh, once again, as, as high as we are on the economic scale right now is, is exactly equal to as low as we were on the economic scale in the 1980s. And um, when we fought the issue of balancing the budget, when our economy, both agriculture and energy, was in the tank, we didn't have enough money to deliver the goods and services that were expected by the people. What we soon found out is cutting across the board doesn't work. It starves everybody to death instead of creating the priority spending that needs to be put in place. And when we looked at the priorities, then we said we're going to fund the number one priority fully. We're going to go down the list until we run out of money. And then we're going to see what we have left over. And some are going to be essential government programs. Some can be eliminated. Some can be merged with others to make them work. But when you looked at priority spending, then you could make decisions, the people could make support decisions for their leaders to say, where do you put the money for its most effect? Just one back to the question, um, you know, where does that involve research? And, and, and a land-grant university, um, shortly before Norman Borlaug's death, Norman Borlaug is, is credited uh, with uh, the father of hybrid seed, obviously, but it's credited with saving more lives in the world than anybody ever. And I had a chance to visit with him shortly before he died. And I asked him, what's the most important thing that we can do for agriculture and agriculture's future? And he said, research. He said, that's the most important thing that you could put on the table. So I would go, <laughs> go back to saying research is the number one priority, and I would figure out how to put dollars into research and out of across the board cutting so that we can create the future of agriculture. Well, folks, we've been going for two hours and 11 minutes. It's gone quick. So uh, let's please give this panel a big round of applause for a great evening.